Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome to RUSI, to virtual RUSI. My name is Paul Lever. I'm a former chairman of the Institute, but also a former ambassador to Germany, uh, which has a particular relevance today because we are going to be talking about Germany. We are lucky to have as our speaker one of Britain's most distinguished journalists. John Kampfner has uh, worked for the Daily Telegraph, for the Financial Times, for the BBC. He has been an editor of The New Statesman, but he began his journalistic career reporting from Berlin at the time of the fall of the wall, and he has always taken a particular interest in Germany. He has now written a book, the title of which is Why the Germans Do It Better, Notes from a Grown-Up Country. It's a brilliant piece of work. It only came out a week or two ago, but it has received extraordinarily positive reviews, appearing, I think, in its first week in the Sunday Times bestseller list. John is going to talk about his book and his views on Germany for about 10 minutes. I will then uh, discuss some of the issues with him for a further 10 minutes, and then it's over to you to put your questions. So, John. Thank you very much indeed, Paul, and um, thank you to everybody for attending. I'm delighted to be here, but I'm also delighted to be a senior associate fellow at RUSI. Um, it's a wonderful organization, as you all know, as RUSI members. I'm relatively new to it. I've done a report um, on Russian and Chinese influence in Germany a month or so ago, but I must say uh, with Karen, with Jonathan, it's a wonderful team and I'm looking forward to doing more with them. Uh, this event, as you've heard from Paul Lever, um, is uh, being I'm fortunate to be chaired by one of Britain's most accomplished ambassadors, and if I may say so, also an author of an excellent book published two or three years ago entitled Berlin Rules. I've been overwhelmed um, by the response, and I thank each and every uh, person who's bought the book, who's commented, who's written to me, who's reviewed it, or who has expressed an interest, or who's criticised it, but who has engaged with it. It's not just the reviews, the attention and the sales, but it's the conversation that it has spawned on the themes that I seek to focus on. Political maturity, competence, and developing a more compassionate, but also resilient society for this troubled world. And I hope those themes have struck a chord. So I'm looking forward to my subsequent conversation with Paul and with all of you to, and to hear your questions and observations. But before then, um, I'll read you now an adapted brief excerpt from the book. I promise it will be short. Um, for those of you who are not familiar um, with it yet, um, it will set out the thesis. So here goes. In January 2021, Germany will be 150 years old. No country has caused so much harm in so little time. Half of Ger modern Germany's lifespan has been a tale of horror, war, and dictatorship. The other half is a tale of atonement, stability, and maturity. No country, I contend, has achieved so much good in so little time. Today, as much of the contemporary world succumbs to authoritarianism, as democracy is undermined from its heart by an out-of-control American president, a powerful China, and a vengeful Russia, one country, Germany stands as a bulwark for decency and stability. This is the other German story. It will discomfort some Britons. It may also discomfort some Germans who cannot bring to think of their country as a moral and political beacon. Germany for sure faces dangers. The refugee influx has exacerbated the cultural divide. Faith in established political parties is waning. Many, particularly in the former East, have turned to the simple slogans of the extremes. The economy has slowed, weighed down by an excessive focus on exports, particularly to China, an aging population and worsening infrastructure. And that was before the pandemic. So you might ask, why the confidence? Why the faith? The measure of a country, in my view, is not the difficulties it faces 
but how it surmounts them. On that test, contemporary Germany is a country to be envied. It has developed a maturity that few others can match. It has done so not because of a preordained disposition, it has learnt the hard way. Coronavirus provided the ultimate test of leadership. Angela Merkel rose to the challenge. She told Germans in precise detail the sacrifices they would have to make and the emergency laws her government would have to impose, something that was extraordinarily sensitive in light of the country's history. She told citizens what she, her ministers and scientists knew and what they didn't. She never boasted. Britain, by contrast, provided a case study of how not to deal with a crisis. The bombast of Boris Johnson was in, was in inverse proportion to his com government's competence. With a mixture of libertarianism and English exceptionalism, the Prime Minister declared with good old fashioned pluck that Britain would get through it. The UK could not have found a leader less qualified to deal with a situation that required attention to detail. This British tragedy did not come in isolation. Some of the mistakes for sure related to health policy, but the causes of the crisis in my view were deeper than that. They were embedded in the fabric of British politics. The first manifestation was Brexit. Germans watched in horror as a country they admired for its pragmatism fell into pseudo Churchillian self-delusion. What they find most troublesome is how so many Britons they know have habituated to the ensuing chaos with so little fuss. And they're flummoxed by the yearning of Brits to seek solace in history. The row over rule Britannia at the proms, only the latest example, as balm for our COVID, Brexit and contemporary woes. So many of my conversations with German begin with the same question. What has happened to you, my British friends? Modern Germany does not fall back on jingoism and cheap rhetoric when the chips are down. Seeing only horror, it has no past to fall back on. That is why it cares so passionately about process, about getting it right, not playing fast and loose. That's why it sees every challenge to democracy as an existential threat. As for British attitudes to Germany, I could not but quote a line from a certain book. To live in today's Germany, as I was fortunate to do for over five years, is to experience to the full the virtues of European and Western civilization. That, ladies and gentlemen, as you may have guessed, is from Berlin Rules, from my interlocutor this afternoon. Most of the time, however, Britain does not know what it wants of the Germans. When the German economy struggles, as it did in the mid 80s and the mid 90s, it's derided as the sick man of Europe, overregulated and hidebound. When Deutschland AG corners markets, it's rapacious. The British don't want Germany to throw its weight around the world, and yet they do want it to pull its weight. Some time ago, I decided I want to write a book such as this. Perhaps it's unfinished business. My journey goes back vicariously to the 1930s. My Jewish father, Fred, fled Bratislava, his hometown, as Hitler's army was marching the other way into Czechoslovakia. His father and mother smuggled the three of them in train carriages and cars back across Germany and out. They were nearly caught several times, but they escaped by the skin of their teeth and by individual acts of kindness. Many of their extended family died in the concentration camps. He made his life in England via a 15 year stint in Singapore, where as a GP, he met my mother, a nurse from Kent of solid Christian working class stock on the ward of the British Army Hospital. My childhood in London in the 60s and 70s contained the usual fare of war songs, jokes and TV shows at the expense of the Krauts. It changed for me at the age of 15. I started to study the language and I fell in love with it. In my early 20s, I jumped at the opportunity to work as a cub reporter in Bonn for Reuters. From there, as Paul alluded to, I was hired by the Telegraph to set up a bureau in East Berlin. I became the paper's first and last accredited correspondent to the GDR. I saw the wall come down. I saw a country unify at lightning pace. On one occasion, I met an unassuming political advisor in East Berlin. She and I sat and drank coffee in the old Palace de Republique. I was struck by her poise, restraint and calm when all around was chaos. Her name was Angela Merkel, if only I had known. So now what? Germany remained the protected child far longer than it should have been. That is over. 
it still spends too much time engaged in introspection. In the 30 years since unification, everyone has chewed over the mistakes. Was it all done too quickly? Were the Vessies arrogant and insensitive? Why were the one or two better aspects of East German life, not least the more emancipated role of women, not absorbed into the new country? These are legitimate questions. Yet I defy anyone to name another country that could have done what Germany did with so little damage. Then came the refugee crisis of 2015. Merkel was slow to appreciate what was happening, yet her eventual response was remarkable. Germany opened its doors to a human stream not seen in Europe since the end of the war. She paid a big price for it politically. Social wounds were reopened, but the decision was right and it was good. What else the chancellor would say as the criticism mounted was a German supposed to do, build camps? Compare that with Britain sending naval ships to intimidate a few motley boats of refugees off its coast. My year long road trip has not made me starry eyed or blind to the country's faults. The Germans I interviewed for my book from prominent politicians and CEOs to artists, volunteers helping refugees, old friends and ordinary folk met at random recoiled at the thesis and the title of the book. You can't say that, they would exclaim with either a shriek or an awkward laugh when I told them the title. They then embarked on a long list of things that the country gets wrong. Everywhere they look, Germans feel anxious. They see all that they hold dear being threatened. They see a world in which democracy is openly mocked by populists and strongmen, from Trump to Putin, from Erdogan to Bolsonaro. They, like everyone, see the climate emergency before their eyes. COVID has forced people around the world to reassess their priorities and to look again at the role of the state and society. So, ladies and gentlemen, as the Merkel era comes to an end, Germany faces a greater test than any equivalent country. It depends for its identity on the democratic post-war settlement, on the rule of law. Unlike Russia and France with their military symbols, or the US with the story of its founding fathers, or the UK with its rule Britannia obsessions, Germany has nothing to fall back on. That is why it cares so passionately. That, in my view, is why it does it better. Thank you and over to you, Paul. John, thank you very much. That was a splendid introduction to the book. I should add for those um, who may be um, a little bit worried about the title. It is not a non-stop paean of praise for everything German. It is uh, a very clever mixture of analysis and anecdote. And the analysis does indeed um, show a light on the things that the Germans uh, don't do perhaps so perfectly. So don't think that this book is simply telling us how wonderful Germany is. Um, I do share though your admiration of the country. Uh, I stand by the quote, uh, it, it is a, a brilliant place to live. Um, but I'd just like to explore one or two of the points that you make in the book and which you touched on in your introduction. Um, the phrase you used a very telling one, nothing to fall back on. Uh, it's quite true. Uh, in Germany, there is no celebration of the past. Uh, there are virtually no symbols of it. There are no events that commemorate it. Um, there is now beginning to be some questioning of whether the Germans couldn't find something in their past to celebrate and that maybe they shouldn't be totally obsessed by those terrible 12 years from 1933 to 1945. I wonder if you feel that you would encourage them to take a bit more pride in their country's other achievements and whether you feel that their own understandable, almost horror of their own past can sometimes make them a bit insensitive to other countries and other people who do take pride in their past and who want to continue to be associated with it. I'm not thinking purely of us, the British, but other countries as well. Well, the, thank you, Paul. I mean, the, in some ways, that's two sets of questions or observations um, in one, and, uh, and um, I'll answer both. 
Um, should Germany take more pride in its past? It's an incredibly difficult question culturally. Um, that is very much happening. Goethe's birthday and um, uh, veneration of philosophers, um, poets, um, uh, artists, um, celebration of Bauhaus recently. That is happening. And I think that's happening in a very, how can I call it, normal way. Uh, uh, there isn't very, there is no apologia uh, wrapped around it, or very little, as far as I can see. It's more contentious, of course. I mean, next year's 150th anniversary of 1871. Um, you know, as far as I'm aware, nothing, I mean, academically things will be happening, but nothing in a governmental way um, is going to be happening. So it's not just that era. It is the, the seeds that um, Germans and most other people believe uh, were helped to be sown that, 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 that caused that era that um, cannot be celebrated. But I've, I've read some fascinating history books recently that go back to um, Jens Biski has just written a fabulous book, um, The History of Berlin, that goes back um, to the Thirty Years War. Others have written books that, that go a far further forward. And certainly at an academic level, um, that it is being um, discussed more. But I mean, there was the Historica Streit uh, in uh, the um, 70s uh, and 80s, which was incredibly bitter, the whole question of, can you sort of hermetically seal uh, 12 years of horror from everything else? And to what degree can you move on? This is still unfinished business. Um, and in some ways, I'm, I think it's quite good that it remains unfinished business, but with this um, caveat that that belongs to an earnest, never to be taken lightly analysis of history, but that it doesn't paralyze Germany from acting in the present and the future. Which brings me to the second part of your, of your question and observation. And that is an increasing view among some analysts that Germany sort of uh, uses um, the memory, uses the um, overcoming of history um, as an excuse not to act. Um, and uh, somebody described it to me as pacifist nationalism. Another person described it to me as modern day German virtue signaling. Um, you know, we are so awful, we cannot go into war, and therefore almost that morphs into um, a sense of superiority because we don't get involved in grubby um, affairs that other countries do. I think that's overstating it, but I've certainly heard that criticism. But I hark back to um, one person I, I quote in the book who goes, who um, refers to Joschka Fischer, um, his speech exhorting the German parliament to agree to um, German military action in Kosovo. And he invoked Auschwitz. Uh, how can we walk on the other side as people are being uh, industrially killed and butchered um, we have to act. And my interlocutor said to me, uh, it's only uh, a year or so ago, we will know that things have become normalized when we don't have to refer to Auschwitz or to the war in order to take difficult decisions, whichever, whichever way we go on the decision, but we don't have to refer to history almost by default. John, thank you. Before we open it up, more widely, can I just ask you to comment briefly on another issue, and that is leadership. As you've said, it's not something that Germans are enthusiastic about, but they are now obliged to exercise it. How do you think they will exercise leadership in relation to Russia, in relation to China? Up to now, their position has been trade is trade. With luck, there'll be a bit of Wandel durch Handel, change through trade, but they have been pretty wary of mixing up trade and politics. Is this going to be sustainable for them any longer? Well, in terms of looking at the future, so much depends on who takes over from Merkel, both in terms of um, the individual as chancellor, but also the colour of the coalition. 
um, and we can develop that more. I wouldn't completely uh, accept your characterization, Paul, if I may. Um, I think that certainly did pertain to a certain time, but things have changed in the last several years. It's incomplete, of course. Um, on China policy, um, big change um, a year and a half, two years ago, with the BDI's report, um, which, um, which was after the Kuka affair and the Chinese take, takeover of one of Germany's most illustrious Mittelstand companies, and very much in the advanced engineering uh, sector in which Germany excels. And that raised the alarm bells um, and Germany's version of the CBI putting out a report um, describing China as a systemic rival and a competitor was um, a big break. Uh, the gift that kept on giving in terms of more and more contracts for German companies was now being seen as a voracious potential pursuer of German um, IP um, and expertise. So that has changed. Uh, the politics is, I mean, the EU um, remains in a fluster about China, but I was, uh, all the surveys and opinion polls recently, a recent one by the ECFR only last week or the week before, looking at a more sober approach across Europe towards China. It's not just the country that builds our bridges and buys our ports and so sorts things out for us. I think the penny has dropped um, of the uh, dangers that uh, China poses and whether the politicians are leading or following, there is definitely, a, in my view, a more sober assessment, but that is to generalize. As regards Russia, um, there's two sides of the Merkel story. I describe in some detail in the book her uh, uh, terrible personal relations with Putin um, uh, and uh, a story uh, which I'll leave to readers to um, uh, read about um, him frightening her to death with his Labrador knowing that she had a phobia. Uh, this was even before she became Chancellor and you know bizarre to uh, recall that really I mean she she has so strong impulse control and she controls herself extraordinarily well but she has never fallen for Putin. She has never liked Putin. She knows she has to do business with Putin from time to time, particularly on Iran and, and other questions. Um, and she has been foursquare. She has been brave, very brave in my move in getting the EU to impose sanctions after Ukraine, Crimea and the Malaysian airliner to get them beefed up. Um, and we will see what happens now um, in light of Navalny, I was talking to German officials only last night. Um, very much the message was, watch this space. The big fly in the ointment, which I'm sure um, audience members would, might want to come to, is Nord Stream, which uh, is a project that very much, in my view, epitomizes the old German thinking and the still existent German thinking of you know, trade matters most. You think they'll cancel Nord Stream? Well, I mean, it's on Nord hold Stream now too. because of the American uh, sanctions, the threat of sanctions. Um, will the Russians produce the technology that will be able to override what the Swiss and the German other companies uh, will do? But there's very much a sense that um, uh, it's up for grabs. Um, I couldn't predict, but it's, it is certainly now being openly discussed. John, thank you. Um, let's move to some questions. Uh, I will pick one or two. Um, one from uh, Alan West, uh, Lord West, I take it. Um, to say that the UK is sending naval ships to intimidate immigrants rather spoils any feeling of balance about your views. That's a shame. My question relates to Germany's unwillingness to invest in military capability. Do you think this will change? Well, I mean, to, to Lord West, I mean, um, I, uh, I hope my views, I'm not particularly offering a book um, that goes for sort of traditional BBC objectivity and balance. There is an argument in this book I hope my the credibility uh, of the book is is not challenged, and certainly 
uh, none has been so far, uh, you can take issue with the arguments. Uh, and I'm afraid to say I absolutely stand by my contention that in complete contradistinction to Merkel, the British approach to Syrian, Iranian and other refugees has been mean spirited. There has been no leadership. And in fact, there has just been a rather toxic um, build walls, keep them out. And of course, we need a very strong, and I'll come to your point, uh, we need a very strong immigration uh, policy and all countries do, but we also need to show compassion, but also we need to show a slightly more long-term view about how we, we deal with that. But I'll be happy to discuss that with you anytime or perhaps just to, to, to beg to differ. Um, as regards to uh, unwillingness to invest in military capability, um, with regard to the 2%, yeah, I mean, absolutely, this has been a running sore and it's absolutely um, makes it very easy for American administrations and not just the Trump administration to uh, criticize Germany. The slight paradox is that uh, if the German economy contracts, it will hit the 2% quite, um, quite easily. Um, but this is the absolute um, question of the moment. I don't think the important though it is, uh, I don't think the figure itself um, is as important as a more robust and open German willingness to get stuck in, mitmachen as the Germans would say, get stuck in in some of the harder um, morally grey um, issues um, that um, pertain to us now and will pertain to us all in the future. John, thank you. I've got um, three questions which relate to Germany and its and its military capabilities and contributions. I'll group them together if the questioners don't mind. First, one from Madeleine Moon, Labour Member of Parliament. Germany spends considerable sums of money on defence, yet its military capability is poor. Many of its platforms not fit for service. What needs to change for Germany to step up and take a central role? in strengthening the NATO alliance? And is it capable of taking on this role? Um, one from Hookie Walker, Sir Harold Walker, former British ambassador to Iraq. I should welcome a word about Germany's inadequate contribution, inadequate in brackets, question mark, contribution to NATO. And one from Mike, Ga Mike Gates, um, former MP, by geography, Germany is central to the future success or failure of European security and defence policy. But when and how will they pre be prepared to overcome what you call their pacifist nationalism? Yeah, and, and hello to all, all three of you. Um, the NATO point I think I addressed in the, in the, in the last um, answer. Um, the, um, and I would simply, uh, refer all of you, um, I mean, in the section of my book in which I do talk at some length without seeking to overemphasize it, the amount of low key German um, work that is being done, working uh, with the Brits and others in the Baltics, um, Russian overflight, um, and various other places as well. Um, but it is absolutely, as I said, my concluding remarks um, to Lord West's uh, observation that um, it is absolutely the time for uh, Germany to step up. Will Merkel's successor um, see that? In some ways, um, Trump has helped and hindered. Um, it's hindered. He has hindered it with his sort of vituperative approach through his ambassador, Richard Grinnell. And if, if he wins, then his uh, soon to be ratified next ambassador is even more hostile to Germany. Um, that makes it much harder for a German leader because um, the, uh, the strong uh, attempts of German leaders to conduct an Atlanticist foreign policy is very much driven by public opinion and when um, uh, presidents are 
openly disparaging as Trump has been, not just on the 2%, but pretty much everything. I mean, I list in some detail all the insults he has leveled um, at Merkel more than any other equivalent political leader. She can, she just lets it water off a, off a duck's back, um, but it makes it harder, harder for her to sell a more robust Atlanticist uh, and a more robust, uh, tougher approach to Russia to her population. So if, and it remains a big if, um, Biden wins, a lot of American policy will remain unchanged. The tough line on China, uh, tough line on Russia, and hopefully that will get tougher still, no more of these Trumpian um, equivocations. It will remain tough on NATO and the 2% and the requirements for European countries to step up, but also the gradual, which was well underway under Obama, um, American pivot away from Europe will continue. It may well be that Biden stalls or reverses the still relatively symbolic American troop cuts from Germany, but he may not, or he may use it as a test on the Germans to see the extent to which they will make the case to Europe um, to pull its own weight more as America gradually withdraws. Thanks, John. A, a slightly different um, type of question now from uh, Mike Maiden. Good to hear from you again, Mike, a long time supporter of Rusi and very experienced in the defense industrial sector. Um, he asked, in the, gov in the German government's political risk register, what do you believe they would regard as the top three risks? Gosh, what a fabulous, what a, what a fascinating um, question. It is, isn't it? Um, my, my, my initial sort of, you know, you have no time, you must press the buzzer, answer it straight away question will be China, Russia and Trump. Um, I'm not sure in which order. Um, but to delve um, more deeply, I mean, obviously, in the non-military sense, uh, the climate emergency and future pandemics and the whole question um, of the resilience of society in a broader holistic and, and non-military way is very much at the top of the agenda. I think just sort of knocking things off as, as we go along, that even <laughs> with an impending recession, uh, although the GDP uh, falls seismic, though they are still are much smaller than Britain, in particular in France and other countries, but still it will be difficult. And that always adds fuel to the extremist fire. But I am cautiously confident that the AFD, certainly in this cycle, has hit its high watermark, and that a lot of Germans who might have just flirted with it out of grievance or boredom or whatever else will actually see the merits in a more mainstream centrist uh, approach to governance, which is based in good old fashioned competence, which I think is much underrated uh, in many countries, um, not, least, not least our own. So I, I think the internal threat is always there. The AFD will be in double figures and more for some time. But just that awful sense of, of danger may be waning to a, to a degree. I wouldn't overstate it, but I wouldn't understate it either. So um, there is, a, or as ever, there is Iran. But I think um, even though it will remain very tough, um, a more um, nuanced American engagement may well ensue if, if there is a change of regime. Maybe it won't. We, we shall see. Rusi members. Uh, will have much stronger expertise on that than me. But I think I'll probably go back to my, to my first three answers. Uh, China, in terms of um, all aspects, but not least the economic threat to Germany, and also the loss, potential loss of market to Germany as things, uh, as things get tougher, as the politics becomes more gritty. Uh, Russia remains a perennial threat. Uh, I think the German ratio of engagements to versus toughness probably needs um, some recalibrating more towards the toughness side, while always keeping um, a line open. Um, and what happens in the United States is front and central. You'll notice, Paul, that in answer to that question, 
um, I haven't mentioned Brexit. Um, <laughs> and that's deliberate because I, um, my view is whatever ensues, whether it's a flimsy deal or a no deal, um, Germany has sort of moved on. Um, there will be a greater emphasis on the E3 uh, in certain areas, but not in as many areas as perhaps the British uh, would like. And they just see it as, as an irritation. And as Britain is just a country that just now needs to be dealt with uh, and kept on board as much as possible, which I regard as a tragedy because the British and German common interest, and you'll know this, and you may have some thoughts on this, in my view, is stronger uh, or was stronger than pretty much any other bilateral common interest uh, in Europe, certainly among major European states. How we maintain that is going to be extremely difficult. I, I, I just add, if I may, that if next time round there's a German government coalition involving the Greens, which many people believe is highly likely, I, I'm sure the German government would include climate change in one of its top three risks. Um, but let's move on to a couple of questions which um, go to the, the, the background to uh, your analysis of Germany. One from Rich Webster. Is it social or structural factors that are most influential in Germany's political maturity and which elements would be best for the UK to replicate? And one from Mike Levy who said he, he agrees with the the cultural contrast with the UK, but wonders if, if Angela Merkel had not been brought up that way or become chancellor, would the result have been different? Uh, I'm not quite sure what result is, is being referred to. Um, would Germany, I assume it means, um, would Germany have been essentially the same country even without Angela Merkel yeah. or without Angela Merkel coming from the background that she had? Well, countries, I mean, you know, counterfactual history is, 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 <laughs> is, yes. is a great, uh, is, is always um, fascinating um, at every level. Um, and that old sort of rather tired old cliche, you get the politicians you deserve or the politicians you need at any particular time. Um, after Schroeder and certainly the Hartz reforms, um, there was definitely a yearning in Germany for solidity and stability, which is a sort of perpetual yearning, but it was um, particularly strong then. I mean, it must be said, as, as you all know, um, uh, colleagues, um, that had COVID not come about, the historical and contemporary political critique of Merkel would be rather different. Uh, there was very much a sense of respect, but come on, your time's up. Uh, you're past your sell-by, it's time to go. The CDU was forcing the pace in terms of forcing her to pre-announce the departure. It had sort of shades of, of, of Blair after 10, 12 years, just, you know, thanks for all your work, now, now time to move on. Um, and um, the... Uh, but COVID has given her a new life. I was asked in, in another event a few days ago, did I think that um, she would stay on? Would she just reverse her decision? And I have no um, uh, knowledge of her mind, but I think it would be for her historical reckoning terrible. Um, as with anything, um, CEOs, football managers, um, leaders, uh, choosing your time of departure if you don't have a, um, a fixed uh, in viable term is is incredibly uh, important and if she by the time she has gone and this time in next year or a couple of months later uh, it feels um, right um, uh, that she does so would Germany have been different yes I mean all all countries uh, uh, um, development depends in very large part um, on uh, who is um, who is leading them she has I think moved I mean and, as, and one always thinks of langsam Abersicher, sort of slow but sure, and, and Germany sort of plods through and she personifies that. But I do go back without um, rehearsing the points I made to the fact that she's been quite good at the stolid side of life, but she's also been pretty darn good 
at crisis management and would um, it's not beholden to all German leaders suddenly to to manage crises well so it could well have um, have been different and I would imagine uh, less successful um, less stable um, with another leader um, I, I'm conscious that I didn't answer the first question or part of the question, so please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, whether it's social or structural factors oh, yeah. that are most influential in Germany's political maturity? Well, again, I would say um, a bit of both. I mean, a lot of the structure for that Reed constitution, we have ourselves, the Brits, to thank. And it's one of the great ironies that we can build good constitutions for others. Uh, and yet we have this awful um, uh, muddle along uh, approach here, which has, in my view, got us into the total mess um, that we got into. And just briefly to digress, what stunned the Germans I spoke to across all political parties and political traditions and what walks of life, what stunned them about Brexit was not so much the result, Course they were surprised but the fact that for the next three years there was pretty much chaos and they just asked but surely you had the other scenario all planned out and you would have had a, a royal cross-party commission to report back to parliament and then this happens and then it happens and then you invoke article 50 after a certain amount of time and and i would just shrug my shoulders and say sorry that's not how it works here we just sort of make it up as we go along and that really um more than the result i think um, was problematic. So their emphasis on structures, which uh, can produce rigidity, of course, um, I think is a defining question. They do struggle to understand lack of structures in other countries. Um, is that a manifestation of uh, societal mores or not is, is for, for others to determine. But, you know, so much of German society and German politics, as you all know, is codified. The relationship um, between uh, the federal state and the lender um, and uh, so much more. Besides, of course, it gets scratchy. Of course, there are areas where it doesn't work, um, where there's pretty tawdry horse trading and that sort of thing. Um, but the, um, the combination of this sort of societal um, stability, which they crave, and the structures that enable it, I've got it to where it is. At the same time, it is also what sometimes holds it back in terms of innovation, entrepreneurialism, um, a good sense of individualism. Uh, for all the positives, there are of course negatives too. A question from uh... Roger Williams, how do you see Germany's relationship with France evolving post Merkel? And how far is Germany's European identity tied to the health of that relationship? And if I could add a, a question of my own to that, could you say a little bit more about what you think Germany really wants from the EU? Uh, it's an issue I explored in my own book. Um, they claim they want to see something they call a political union, but they have never, as far as I'm aware, spelled out in any authoritative way what this political union would be, what it would look like, what powers the centre would have, and so on. Uh, the, the, the only thing one could, until recently, have said about their views was that whatever it is, it mustn't cost the German taxpayer any more money. Well, things have changed with the Corona Recovery Fund. Mm. The Germans have now agreed to EU borrowing, admittedly in a very circumscribed form. Do you think that this means that the dam has finally broken? Or do you think that this was just a one-off and that in reality, the Germans in future will continue to be very reluctant to give the EU uh, more financial powers. I mean, I must say, Paul, you write very uh, cogently and powerfully um, about the German approach to the Greek debt crisis. 
Um, and I, I was very struck by that, as, as others have too. And it's indelibly etched on German minds that uh, you know, the, the newspaper pictures of um, uh, of a poster in Athens with uh, Merkel with a with a Hitlerian moustache, um, and that real sense of Germany as the bad guy, which paradoxically is exactly the reason Germany uh, is so uh, zealous about maintaining European unity, um, and it would and hates you know and hated the idea, notwithstanding whether you agreed or you disagreed with their approach um, to Greece, hates the idea that Germany could, uh, that, that Europe could be seen um, as a negative for Germany. And uh, to, to the first question um, about France, um, again, I was discussing that with, with, with German officials last night, and there's a sense of, uh, there was certainly a, uh, the Merkel-Macron relationship, as you all know, has been scratchy. The Macron um, sort of denounce of, of NATO um, was not helpful, the sort of Trumpian overtones um, about it, and also Macron's rather glib invocation of a sort of Eurasian powerhouse to counter China was very much sort of sniffed at um, in Germany as being both overreaching, uh, and they don't like surprise, and they don't like flourishes, uh, they certainly don't like being surprised. Um, and uh, But there is a sense now, excuse me, that I would contend that partly because of Brexit um, and uh, partly generally in terms of the developments in Russia, China and uh, the United States, um, that the, the French exceptionalism, the sort of view that uh, as, as you'll know, Paul, uh, better than I do in, in German political circles, there is always a sense of, for France, Europe is important and it's nice to have, but it's not existential. Uh, and in Germany, it is existential. Um, I quote Thomas Bagger, um, known to many of you as the foreign, the foreign policy advisor to Steinmeier in the president's office. He wrote, a, as you all know, a fabulous piece um, a couple of years uh, ago, um, arguing that Germany depends not just on international institutions for its raison d'etre, for its almost its oxygen, um, but it also depends on the continuation, if not um, a further increase in, then certainly the continuation of uh, liberal democracy around the world and the the populist wave um, around the world notwithstanding the internal pressures of the AFD that were acute but the global phenomenon absolutely stuck a dagger into into the heart of German confidence um, because without that um, uh, Germany feels itself imperiled whereas countries with a history with a proud history, France, United States, UK, and others, um, have never felt that dependency on institutional frameworks the way that the Germans do. And therefore, the French relationship, as, as I would say bilaterally, is, is, is very important, but in helping to, um, to further that cause is more important still. John, um, thanks. It, it's interesting what you said about um, the shock in Germany of seeing those pictures of Angela Merkel um, in Greece. Um, do you think that that shock, this horror at the idea that um, Germany uh, could be perceived as being, as causing the EU to be a problem, was that one of the reasons why when it came to the, the COVID recovery fund, the German government, uh, after some reflection, eventually took a position that was a lot more generous than many would have expected. And certainly I think a lot more generous and open 
than the Dutch government felt comfortable with. Was this, do you think, because they feared that Italy might, possibly others too, that Italy might go the same way as Greece and uh, that the sense of alienation in some parts of the Italian electorate would grow even stronger? I would say there are three aspects um, to the answer. Um, good old fashioned self-interest, an element of morality, and also economics. Um, looking at them all in economic terms, as you were talking about um, ahead of the last question, Paul, the end of the black zero, the end of uh, fiscal rectitude um, was a massive shock um, to the German system. I mean, it had been much discussed in, in, in prior years about have we gone too far? Should we loosen the purse strings to a degree? Um, should we allow for you know um, uh, an unbalanced budget, if, if if only slightly? Well, that was just blown asunder. And so once that had happened, then transferring that onto a multinational level um, made the rigid uh, "this far and no further" uh, argument harder to sustain. So that in a, in a few sentences would be the economic. Um, on the um, self-interest, I mean, in a way, the self-interest and the moral are the same thing. Um, it wasn't just the terrible wrangling that took place, um, but it was the pictures, particularly from Italy, which it's, it's recovery in, into the second wave is, is, is quite remarkable, but the abject um, uh, the all-encompassing nature of COVID on Italy um, in, in the first wave this spring uh, was absolutely, as you all know, threatening to undermine uh, inter alia European cohesion. And for Germans, just as they did and other countries did, the uh, quick um, erection of borders um, across Europe and also the sort of nationalization of PPE and the, just that sort of instinct of countries to close in upon themselves um, and to look after number one first, which they did as much as, as anybody else. But that came as quite a shock. It shows the, the flimsy nature, uh, just as they've seen the flimsy nature of, of liberal democracy, so they've seen the, the fragility of the European project uh, once again, but in a different form, uh, very much highlighted. And so uh, my uh, thought on, on that would be, uh, whatever we do, do whatever it takes uh, to keep European cohesion um, going through this unprecedented time. Thank you, John. Um, we're beginning to run out of time, but I'll try and fit you one last question. Um, it's from Marcus Geiser, who works for the International Committee of the Red Cross. Um, he, he asked, well, he has two questions. One is Germany's Security Council membership two year period um, comes to an end, the end of this year. Uh, what, do you, what do you make of their role in the United Nations? And secondly, he notes that Germany is a huge contributor to the um, to global humanitarian assistance, and wonders whether you think that the trend started in 2015 uh, will continue, and whether humanitarian aid, to what extent is it supported by the German people and by German parties? I know you've you've touched on that to some extent already. Um, as regards the Security Council, I would refer to others who, uh, I don't refer to it in my book, but others at, at Rusi um, who might have uh, a clearer expertise on that. I mean, the Security Council is now a place where so little business of any meaning can take place because of two things, the institutional um, uh, um, dysfunctionality of the Russian and the Chinese approach and their vetoes, 
and also just the absolute it's been, talk, been talked about for 30 years plus um, inability of anybody to actually change the structures uh, of the P5 to allow in um, other countries. So within that context of dysfunctionality, or at least only a certain amount of business can be done, and most of that business, apart from grandstanding, which may have occasional uses, takes place um, behind closed doors. Um, I would uh, think it a, a, a reasonable um, score sheet. Um, as regards to humanitarian aid, uh, yes, I mean, it is one of the things that Germans uh, look to, but as much developmental aid um, as humanitarian, as partly their sort of get out of jail card for um, for global being seen to be a global and international player. Um, while still being um, more restrained on the more military side of, um, of life. Um, uh, and one can only hope and assume uh, that that will continue, notwithstanding the, the exhortation that I think we all, or most of us all feel, um, that Germany uh, needs to step up much more on the, on the, uh, the more difficult, the less virtuous side of foreign policy. Interestingly, um, Paul, just as we are concluding the, the substantial part, um, I was expecting to be asked quite a lot about cyber as well, because the German approach on and the, the threats to Germany and the hacking um, of uh, the Bundestag's email system and much more besides is another um, existential threat, not just to all of us. Um, every country is developing its cyber resilience at pace um but germany was quite slow on that and is um and that should was obviously uh should be thrown into the the basket of of hybrid threats john thank you we have i fear our time is up uh, my apologies to those um listening and watching who wanted to put a question but there just wasn't time for it uh Thank you, John, for a magisterial presentation and for the way you dealt um, with all uh, the, the questions. I would urge everyone to read the book. Um, it, it, it is uh, a remarkable piece of work. Are you going to Are you going to tell us, John, where you can buy it at? Ad no, I, I wasn't rates? going to be. I wasn't going to be as grubby as that because I think um, I think uh, you all received it um, uh, or received information in the emails and. Um, and of course, every author um, would like to uh, sell books. But and you know, on the point of the title, I could say why Germans do most things better um, much of the time. But I'm not sure it would have it would have sold um, so well. No, what I was going to say, Paul, and to all of you colleagues at Rusi, that whether you agree with me, whether you disagree with me, uh, please feel free either on Twitter, um, you know, my name at John, at John Kampner, or email me, or get hold of me via Rusi or whatever. Everybody else. I would be absolutely thrilled. Obviously, all authors want to sell books, but I also want to develop these conversations around Germany's place, but also around the concepts of social resilience and competence and and um, uh, and governance. So, uh, anyway, my email is john at jkampfner.net with the J at the front. Um, and anyway, back to you, Paul. But thank you, everybody, for engaging with me this afternoon. John, thanks again. I would I would say that only um, there's one issue that you didn't address in your book, probably wisely, and that is the fundamental question: Do the Germans have a sense of humour, and is it one that's easy for non-Germans to understand? Um, my my only criticism that I would make of that country, my only suggestion for how they might improve, I think they might try to get a bit more fun out of life. Um, but that said, you have described a country um, whose virtues are remarkable. And I'm glad that at last a British writer um, has felt it able and indeed necessary to say so in public. Thanks to all of you listening and watching. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the proceedings. Uh, I hope you'll find um, other Rusi events that will catch your imagination. 
and I hope therefore that we will be seeing you and joining with you in the future as well. But thanks again and a virtual round of applause to John Kampfner. And to you, Paul. Thank you.